Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, I'm Andrew Sumner and today I've got a real treat for you. Titan Comics uh, recently launched the graphic novel version of the uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber massively long-running stage musical The Phantom of the Opera. Um, it, the, the book is um, written by the great Cavan Scott, um, well-known Star Wars author and edited by David Leach. And they recorded this New York Comic Con panel with me all about the Phantom of the Opera a couple of weeks ago. Here it is for you to enjoy. Take care. Welcome to New York Comic Con 2021. And welcome to the Titan Comics Phantom of the Opera graphic novel panel. My name is Andrew Sumner from Forbidden Planet TV and I am privileged to be joined by author supreme Kevin Scott. How are you, mate? I'm okay, mate. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. All the better for seeing you. Oh, and you. senior Titan editor, Supreme, Mr. David Lan Manley Leach. You know, I've known you for 20 years, mate, and I always got your name completely wrong then. How yeah, are you, big right. guy? Uh, uh, listen, Bernard, I'm, uh, I'm great. I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> We're working hard on that next album. That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> How are you doing, big guy? You good? Yeah, I'm all right. Absolutely fine. Yeah, very excited to be here to talk about Phantom. One, yeah. of, my, one of my favourite projects that I've ever done for Titan. We are all tremendously excited about this. Uh, uh, privileged that uh, Cav came on board as author, absolutely, and and also got some luscious and beautiful artwork from Jose Maria Baroy. Uh, and um, before we get started, I got a message from everybody at Andrew Lloyd Webber's really useful group this morning, and uh, and what they had to say to both of you and to Jose uh, was that it was very important to us that uh, this book held its head high with the finest graphic novels and which was why we wanted uh, Titan to publish it and why we were so pleased that Cavan and David and Jose were working on the book and we couldn't be happier with the outcome. We're tremendously pleased. So that's from Lloyd Webber headquarters at about 10am wow. this morning. That's lovely to hear. That is, yeah. That's fantastic. It, it, um, I've got goosebumps. I really I, have. I, I, know, I know that they are beside themselves with, with, our, uh, with, with the outcome. And I think, I think you've just done a fantastic job, Cav, and I think it's, it's beautiful artwork. So it's amazing. It, the book, it, this graphic novel is developed from uh, the original libretto of uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Lloyd Webber's um, Phantom of the Opera. Uh, that libretto was co-written, of course, with uh, Richard Stilgo, a famous figure in British pop culture history, and with Charles Hart, a very well-known lyricist who at that point, was it was very early on in his career. Hmm. But to begin with, um, David, how did you feel when you knew that Titan were going to be working on this graphic novel? Uh, I found it exciting because, because the idea of, of adapting uh, an opera, a musical opera for a graphic novel, uh, I hadn't done anything like that before. I thought it. I thought it was an extremely exciting challenge. It was um, uh, for me as as, the, as an editor. You know, it's finding the right art and artist and writer team. And with, with Kevin, I mean, it was um, it was almost a foregone conclusion actually going to Kevin. I mean, he was he was one of the very first writers I approached. And likewise with um, Jose as the artist, he was he was he was. He was my top choice instantly. I only it came down to three artists, but he was the, he was my top choice, and and his tryout piece just blew me away. Actually, his tryout piece is in the book, which is he did the chandelier job as his tryout piece, and it was like flipping egg. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was it was uh, um, I've I've absolutely loved it. It's, it's been an epic. It's been an epic to put it together. But I, I bloody loved it. So how did I feel at the beginning? I just saw it as, as another challenge. And I, what I've loved about working for Titan is that I keep getting given unusual projects to work on. And this was by far the most unusual one I've been given so far. I mean, yeah. I mean, for, for those of you watching, uh, I, 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 and you know, I, d I might not be into the same level of British comics law that we live with at Titan and with, with our creators, uh, David Manley Leach is, 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 has one of the most diverse editorial resumes out of anybody in the UK. Supremely creative and you are indeed, you are absolutely the man to go to with the wild and crazy new Titan project. And uh, this was right in your wheelhouse, I think. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think one of the things that you, you got right straight away was getting Cavan on board as the author. Now, for, for, again, for anybody who is unaware, Kevin has, has produced a, a, a wild array of, of lovely comics 
over the last decade, but is currently riding high with his work for Star Wars, which is just absolutely, as we were saying off camera before this panel, um, doing incredibly well for him and for Lucasfilm. So what was it like for you to, what was it attracted you, Cav, about the world of Phantom of the Opera? But it was such, as David said, such an unusual idea. Um, and it was so intriguing to take a stage musical. I mean, I did have um, a history of the Phantom. I suppose history is probably overblown. But I, I, when I was growing up as a teenager, I was a bit of an odd teenager, which will come as a surprise to no one who knows me. Um, I was a mad horror fan, loved monsters, and also loved musical theatre. The two very, very rarely met um in any real sense and then phantom came out and i remember hearing that first sort of da, na, 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 and getting the sense of the melodrama and and i was obsessed i had the um old hammer phantom film on on a really scratchy old vhs which i think i played and played and played and played when i was a kid um and so the combination of like the classic universal hammer monsters and, and and a stage musical just just seemed too good opportunity then, um, and it's I'd seen it in the stage, you know, a, a, a couple of times when I was up in Manchester University, it was there. I went there again, um, and so yeah, the, the thought of of adapting it, it was one. It, to be honest, when I first got the call, it was like, well, that's just insane. Why would you do that? Um, and then it sort of needles away at you, almost like someone singing in your ear at night um, and saying, do it, you know, give, give it a go because it, it could be incredible. Um, and actually, when you get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, it's it's because it's a performance, you know, the, the entire story is a performance. People are performing within the story. Um, it translates so easily into, into a comic form. Um, and the excitement for that was that people might pick this up who weren't comic readers. You know, I yeah. spent a lot of time writing for comic fans um, and comic readers. This was something that might be picked up people who have just seen the musical or, you know, or, or saw it years ago and want to relive it in some way or are fans of the film. Um, and so it was the chance to retell the story to, to a new audience who might, it might be their sort of like um, gateway into comics as well. And I thought that was very exciting. I think I think that's a very good point, Kevin. I mean, uh, definitely that, that that's the way I, I approached looking for the right artist, which was the idea of a of a graphic novel that wasn't for your, your traditional comic book reader. It was it was reaching out almost to the people who were fans of Phantom of the Opera. It was it was trying to tap into a new market. I think that's a, that's a very good point. It, it was, and I think that's what makes um, um, uh, Baroy such a good artist is that I think his artwork transcends. So it's it's something that's accessible by people who don't normally read comics. Uh, and people who do, I think, I think his his, his artwork is quite universal. For for me, uh, I, I I the first time I saw Phantom of the Opera was when you you I and our wives went to see it mm. um, before the project started. That's the very first time, and uh, I I absolutely loved it. Although they did ask me to shut up because I kept shouting out, "He's behind you!" <laughs> <laughs> David's response was amazing at the point where spoilers, <laughs> the the Phantom appears during Masquerade. Um, he shouted out something that's, that's linked to the word flipping neck, um, but very loud <laughs> in shock and surprise and just sheer glee. Yeah. And it was brilliant to see because it was yeah. brilliant to see. I mean, where Phantom is in London at the theatre, it's quite a small, intimate theatre in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, you're, you're right on the stage and, and the, the theatre is obviously, the entire theatre is part of the set. And so it was, it was really, it was great as someone who loves theatre so much and loves musicals to see the effect that it had on someone who'd never seen it before, you know. Yeah. And we, we, we all know the music from the, you know, the, the records and, and you see it on telly and things like that. Um, but to see the effect it had, the live performance has. And that was really exciting because obviously we were just starting out at that point. We were yeah. discussing how we were going to do it. Um, and so I thought if we can get that excitement of someone, you know, experiencing the stage version onto the page, well, that, that's something to aim for. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really inspiring to, to have that moment where <laughs> when David shouted out in the middle of the performance, which was, is still one of my favourite moments of this. Yeah, I, I've been blessed to uh, sit in the cinema many times where, with Mr Leach, where he, where he engages with the film verbally, and that's yeah. a film. So I can only imagine how glorious it must be to actually be in the 360 degree world of theatre to have David interacting directly. With what it was like he was a character in the play. Play. He yeah. was the, you know, <laughs> he was the bad. fifth beetle of, uh, <laughs> no. yeah. but it was, but it was great. It was just that thing that people. This is a story people can get invested in, and you know, and it's a story that people get drawn into. So, um, as you know, all the best graphic novels do that as well. So, yeah, I think it is a perfect mix. 
I think I think it's also worth pointing out at this point, Sumner, that you yes. and I both regaled the uh, Diamond audience at the San Diego Comic Con back in 1999, 19, sorry, 2019, with our own rendition of Phantom of the Opera. That is very, very true. <laughs> who that was Christine is, uh, and who was the Phantom? I need well, to know. Well, quite this. obviously, I was Christine. <laughs> and I was and, the Phantom. And, and David was the Phantom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was the Abbott and Costello version of the, uh, <laughs> the, the Phantom of the Opera theme. And, and you know what? Now that you've said that, if you're enterprising enough, I think you can actually yeah. find that online somewhere. You can. So, you know, if you look. really want to complete your <laughs> Phantom experience. I do. I do. We should put the link in the next volume. You know, when we do the reprint, we should have a link to the YouTube video at the back. <laughs> I'd also say that we, that we that people came up to us after that and actually shook our hands and said it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you took that as the compliment it was intended. That's absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. It was clearly absolutely. a compliment. Clearly. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. No, it was a glorious moment. I, 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 and... Uh, and, and uh, I feel that we honoured the spirit of the project. That is for sure. I do too. Sure. I do too. Absolutely. Uh, what you guys are tapping into in, 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 me into with, with this element of the conversation is something I think is a really key part of the whole Phantom of the Opera mythos. And some of the guys are really useful, and Andrew Lloyd Webber and the creative team of of the of the of the opera have done really really well. Of the show have done really well, and that's right from the moment when we all first heard that Phantom of the Opera theme with the release of the uh, the initial single, which, uh, as I recall, was Steve Harley from Cockney Rebel mm. and Sarah Brightman, right? And mm. and you covered it off before, the, the, the main theme was the... Da -na 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 -na. Mm -hmm. It's the show, like most Lloyd Webber shows, that's, that's A, sung through, so there's very little spoken dialogue. Mm. And it's also constructed on a couple of like, key musical motifs that are earworms that run through the whole thing. So even if you walk into the theatre and you've never heard the Phantom theme before, by the time you walk out, you can't get it out of your head, right? Now, that's one of the great powers of, of Phantom the Opera as a piece of, of theatre. What were the challenges of translating that on those, those, those verbal and oral motifs into a co in, into a comic book into a graphic novel i think one of the things we thought of originally was how obviously how are we going to do this when as you say most of the dialogue is delivered in songs and and in within the musical there's a the, there's a reason for that they are opera singers you know and, and a, lot, a lot of it is is performance as well um and so i was thinking do i step it back into actual dialogues that they're saying the words that sometimes rhyme that might be a bit odd but i was like no people know it still has to feel like a musical and um obviously i want them to especially if they've come to this as a phantom fan and you've seen the musical and you've got the soundtrack albums and all that thing i want you to hear the music as you're reading um yeah. and so there was there was no question that we were you know we would adapt it into spoken word because then it wouldn't be phantom of the opera it, you know it would be an adaptation of a version of the original novel rather than an adaptation of the musical which is what the, the important thing there have been other versions of phantom um you know that can that can tell that story this has to be related to the stage version um obviously we had to we couldn't fit everything in you know so we had to to carefully abridge some of it while keeping the meaning um and and also giving the sense of the song um and yeah, I mean, there is a there is a, a cassette in there, you know, that we we use musical notes to to indicate when people are singing. And I like the fact that these people sing at each other because it it adds to the theatrical and slightly otherworldly um, feeling that you get from Phantom. You know, these are people who are consumed by music, and so we try and get that on the page. Yeah, well said. I, I, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, and I think that's what you've achieved as well, actually, mate. What was that? What was that process like for you, big guy? The the converting music to to comic books. Um, well, it was it was mainly talking to to, to Kevin at the beginning and discussing it. I mean, I think what really helped is once we'd seen the show together, we we had a we had a um, a very long conversation about it. And we were discussing it and about elements that that we knew had to be in it. So it was we discussed what the key bits of it should be. You know that that. that obvious things like that the, the chandelier drop you know that had to be that was going to be the big bit of it you know so it was discussing the different beats that we would take from the show and and, and it was it. it after that it was mainly um you know 
Kevin and I discussed it, and then and then I left him to get on with it. And then when the the script was delivered in three parts, we we did it in in, in a, almost three acts, I suppose. And mm. so that that made it easier to handle. It made it easier to uh, for um, Jose to work on. Uh, so my, my once he'd you know read it, I compared what, what he'd done with the libretto, and and I I he he bloody nailed it. You know, I mean, Kevin, your, your script was was fantastic. I mean, yeah. I I went through it. Uh, and I was sort of like comparing the two and I just thought, Jesus, he's, he's got this completely, you know, it, it, it seemed to flow so well. It looks so good uh, reading it as, uh, as the script and thinking about the pages in my head. It just worked, you know, the, 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 there wasn't a sense that anything was rushed. There was no sense that it was uh, things were too truncated. So I, I, I always feel that, that, that when you when you work with writers and artists who are really good, you have to trust them. So it, I basically trusted Kevin right from the word go. I mean, we, you know, we worked and we talked before and I trusted him. So uh, my, my role then comes that once he, he, he delivers, delivers the job, I go through it. I look for any any issues, but there weren't any. Normally, I might suggest combining panels and there might be in a few occasions where I suggested combining panels. But on the whole, the, you know, it, it was it was glorious. It didn't need a, a great deal of work. It, I was happy to let Kevin get on with it. I think because what we had done, we bl we blocked it out. So yeah. I sent David a massive document with literal representations of each page and which part of the script would go on to those pages. And so we knew from the off how it would look from like a thousand foot high, you know, so we could yeah. see the shape of it. The other thing I did right at the beginning was I went back and looked at other adaptations in other media of the musical. So I watched the film. Um, I watched, there was a performance of it at the Albert Hall where they... Um, the Albert Hall, a uh, big concert hall in London, for those who don't know, um, they did it on a round and, you know, and they adapted the musical to fit the shape of the Albert Hall. Oh, wow. So it was, it was, that was good because it was a sense of, obviously when you see it on stage, you know, they're very clever how they use the stage and how they make the stage feel bigger. But, you know, they are largely obviously restricted to that stage. When we've got the comic and when you've got the film, you can, move with the characters you know um and you can do things i wanted to do things that you couldn't do on stage so mm -hmm. there are moments in the graphic novel when the various players are discussing what the phantom is demanding of them and you zoom in and jose has captured it so beautifully you zoom in and you see the phantom's eye watching them yeah in the background which in the stage is done by hearing his voice booming over you know booming over the auditorium um, on stage, on, you could get quite claustrophobic in the comic. You know, you get that sense that as Christine's passing mirrors, he's behind the mirrors, and all those, you know, that sense that he is everywhere. Um, and you can use all the things that you have as your toolbox as a comic writer and creator and artist. You know, you can crash into people's faces. You can see the reactions. You can see what's happening off stage in the reactions of the people who are there um, in the panel. And so it was great to be able to use those tricks that we use all the time, whether you're writing Batman or Dennis the Menace or, you know, or Luke Skywalker um, and relate it to something um, like the Phantom. It was, it was a really interesting process. I think I think one one of the things that that, um, that you obviously wrote in the script and also what um, what uh, Jose did with the artwork was there's always a sense when you when you see when you see stage plays that have been adapted to movies and they try and expand them outside they always feel a bit clunky whereas mm. what what you did with, the, with with the graphic novel was that that you you took the story like when when uh, Christine goes to the graveyard and the phantoms there that's wonderful but it never feels like it's it's sort of just been shoehorned in you know it, it, and I think what what what, what was done with the book it expanded the world it, it sort of put it in paris it moved it out of the, it moved it out of the uh, the opera house and it didn't feel oh this is just it's just there for effect it actually was part of the whole which i thought worked so well with it you know that that those parts like that, that, that there's there was one thing in 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 the actual opera that i thought was amazing which was uh when he you suddenly realize that he's been lying up in the rafters in a chandelier suddenly he sits up and you realize he's been there for ages but you haven't seen him you haven't seen and i thought that was fantastic but there was no way that we could we could recapture that but the way that you did it like um like you say that that lovely that lovely zoom in where you go you see them talking and you go into the crack in the wall and there's his eye looking through and that sort of stuff and when you would cut through to him actually watching and you'd be the close-up of the eyes it, it was so good you really it really i thought you, you adapted that idea so well you know and you, like you say by using the, the comic medium it it it, it it was terrific. It, it it just felt it felt. That's what I couldn't believe. It felt so right for comics. Mm. You know, I, I was surprised that you know I kept thinking there was always the that part. Fits. 
yeah, the story fits. And there was always that, that sense of, oh, my God, it, it, is this just madness? You know, is is this going to work? And and I, I was when I get the artwork in, I was just like stunned by how well it was working because it was like, bloody hell, this really works. And, and you know, one last thing, because I'm rambling, I'm getting too excited. No, this is good stuff, big guy. It's good stuff. <laughs> But the, the, there's one that is very funny because the, there's there's one thing I remember as a kid. Now, for me, Phantom of the Opera is the original silent 1920s version, mm. which which terrified me as a kid. It's one of the one the, of the, the Lon Chaney things. one. Yeah, Lon Chaney, mm. absolutely fantastic. I love hugely that iconic image. Yeah, yes. Oh his god, face. and the makeup with the with the yeah. upturned nose. I love that. So for me, I've always been really interested in the Phantom, and I remember the the, the Herbert Lom Hammer version that you mentioned earlier on. Mm. So I've always I've always been really fascinated by by the idea of the character. I think it's wonderful. There, there's one scene which I love, which is the the the, the masquerade ball. Where where he he comes and on, on stage it was amazing the way you suddenly realise he's there because you don't see him arrive and then suddenly he's walking through the crowd and there he is, I thought that was amazing. That's that's a bit where I you know I, I was like fucking hell <laughs> because it was so it was exhilarating and, and in the comic I think I think you captured that too the way that the the Phantom appears and in that glorious crimson red outfit it's just um. It's fantastic. That's the great thing about Phantom. It has got this legacy, um, and you know, and, and the Lon Chaney, the Lon Chaney version. I mean, I love the fact when you go to Universal, the set's still there because they won't take yeah. it down oh, because wow. they, you know, yeah. they think yeah. the Phantom is haunting it. So you you can see it on the tour. You go through and you just see the side of the set for Phantom of the Opera still there, and <laughs> and it, it was the very clever thing I think they did with the original musical that they they had that Mask of the Red Death you know, moment with the Phantom when he turns up with the skull and everything that relates straight back to those old classic, you yeah. know, um, black and white and the universal horrors. And it has got that sense of the Gothic, which Jose captures so well mm. um, in the art. And again, we kept saying throughout the script, go for the Gothic, you know, because you get that in the atmosphere when you watch it because you're in a Gothic theater. You know, and then it's built in, and you know, and they've and they've ch they've dressed it in. You know, when you look up and you realise that the gargoyles and the angels are actually more demonic than anything. Yes. Um, you know, and so we wanted to bake that into the graphic novel as well. That just sense of gothic and history and creeping, slightly rotten dread when you get down into the the, the phantoms um, lair and things that we could pull out that perhaps they don't focus on too much in some of the adaptations, like the fact that he has a marionette of Christine there as a bride and it's just i mean that's pure horror you know yeah, and, yeah. Um, and it's super something, super creepy yeah and it's something yeah. we can we could emphasize more in the comic without making it feel like it's derailing the action and what's happening you know but you just point out this man is properly insane and look what he's doing that's why christine's really freaked because there's a dummy of her down there and we don't know what he's been doing a lot of time down in the dark and it's the kind of thing we could <laughs> We could put that in without, as I say, without derailing the story. Without because it's it's there. It's written. It's in the it's in the original script. Um, it's in the original songs. In the original set designs. And actually, the set designs are the interesting thing. So I think I'm right, David. And you might have to correct me if I'm wrong. But every version of Phantom has slightly different designs in like the mask and the costumes. Yes. Um, and so with this, we were able to say to Jose, "This is Phantom of the Opera, but it hasn't got to be." A copy of the costume and the mask that you know Michael Crawford wore, wore, wore in the original, or they wore in the film, or they wore in the current um, adaptation, uh, the current version of it on stage. It's it's our it's the Titan Comics version of yeah. the mask. It's the oh, yeah. Titan Comics and Jose version of the Mask of the Red Death. You know, so everything about it is the spirit of the original production. But like every production that's come since, it's adapting it and making it its own. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, the other things also is that is that we were sort of encouraged to come up with our own version. You know, they didn't mm. Rudd didn't want us to 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 base it on one actual performance. It had to be something fresh. That the mask was 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 interesting because uh, we back and forth uh, the mask, Jose and myself and Rudd, we back and forth it to, to get it right. And I think uh, when you say Rudd, you mean really useful group. Oh yes, right. sorry, yeah, re mm. really useful group. Yeah, apologies. Um, uh, and the, the, the mask idea, uh, the the thing that we it started off was the the whole uh, pathos and humor mask you know one one sad one happy that was the starting point you know uh, with jose and he came up with that that quite almost almost um german in style you know that it's quite angular the mask is it's quite sort of uh yes yeah, quite edgy i liked it so i think it, it, that was quite good fun to try and come up with an original mask but i think i think i don't think we can stress just how brilliant an artist jose is mm. though if you look at i mean 
those backgrounds are staggering when he's when he's drawing like the inside of the opera house and all that they did just oh bloody hell that man is 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 genius no yeah. it, it really is beautiful artwork it's fascinating hearing you guys talk talk about this because i think one of the reason um phantom of the opera abides and has been the amazing success you know around all the theater capitals of the world that it has yeah. and it has has dominated both broadway and at the west end for as long as it has is because it's many things in one in one package so it's not just the incredibly affecting and stirring earworm music you know, it's not just the genius of Andrew Lloyd Webber, and it's not just how clever the libretto is, and it's not just the fact that it's always been really well cast. Cav, you mentioned the fact that when it first debuted on stage, it was Michael Crawford, very, mm. very famous English mm. theatre figure, English TV figure. And, and it, it, you, what happens with a lot of shows is that initial performer is indelibly linked with with that role but the role of the phantom is bigger than any one person who plays him and there's been some incredible performers throughout the years who have taken that lead role but the phantom abides and it constantly lives on but i th i think it's not just the fact that you've got this great musical it's a it's a an expert exercise in a theatrical kineticism when you sit down you think you're going to get one thing if you've not seen it before. You think you're going to get a musical version of Phantom of the Opera. But what you get is this 360 degree yeah. experience. Yeah. You're on a roller coaster. It starts and it's kind of floods your senses on so many levels. And I think that is why it's so well suited to a mm. comic book adaptation. And I think the real triumph of what you've, you've all delivered is you've captured that kineticism and, and put it on the page. And well, I, I think, think I think everybody thought you guys were going to do a great job, but I think the job that you did has just like blown everybody away because you've so expertly captured that kinetic essence. I, I think, thank you. I mean, uh, uh... I think I think absolutely I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the crazy thing is having this talk because I haven't thought about Phantom for a while because with most projects, once you finish it, move on to your next one. And the crazy thing is I'm seeing so much of, of the stage play back in my head. We're talking about it. And, it. and 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 it's funny because the bits that stick out were the bits that stick out in the book. I remember really being excited watching watching the, the musical when when the, um, the, the boat, the, the gondola. Where he pushed the gondola across the stage, and it was like that's amazing because because all this smoke filled the screen, uh, the, the stage, and these candles rose out of the ground, and it was it was terrific. And seeing how Jose handled that, you know, that lovely scene where they're 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 in the sewers and and the phantoms punting the, the gondola down through the sewers, you've got the sunken head, and you've got all the little tea lights floating in the water. What I what I really wanted to capture with this was this was that if you'd seen the stage play and you loved it, when you read the comic book, you'd be transported. You'd like like Kevin said, you'd hear the music. And I think this is what the book does so well is it's not just like most adaptations of movies. Okay, they're okay, but you know all the Batman adaptations they look great, but they don't really capture the, capture the movie because they're they're so truncated. But with this, you you've got time to get invested with the story. So. You, it becomes its own thing. I'm sure when you start reading it, and if you're a Phantom fan, you'll hear the music. I bet by the end of it, you've forgotten the music and you're reading the story because it, it transports you to to another world. But by the end of it, you're going to still feel connected to the Phantom that you love. I, I think it's a... Uh, uh, I am so proud of this book. I, I can't begin to tell you. I, I, um, I, I've been doing Titan books for 13 years now. This is my favourite thing that, that, Titan, that I've done for Titan. I'm so honoured to have been a part of it, you know? So I love it. <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful thing to say. I mean, Cav, to get into the nuts and bolts of it for a sec, mm. of the characters that you had to adapt uh, for the script for the for the comic, which were the ones that you, which were your favourites to write? Who who did you respond to? Um, you know, the most the most extremely. I mean, it's it's going to be obvious, but it is the, our two leads with um, with the Phantom and Christine because. They've got such a twisted relationship. Yeah, and it's, you know, you have to think about what Christine goes through. And it's a real, obviously, a, there's a Beauty and the Beast parallels there. And, you know, and what does she feel for him? And, and, and uh, you know, how is he manipulator and twisting her? And, and the Phantom is a pure comic book villain. And I don't mean that in any way. You know, you know how much I love comic books. And, and you know, but he stands up there with the the greats of the joker and the, and dr doom and because he 
is that tragic villain. You know, mm. he, he there is a reason he's like this and he has gone further than he should have in just about every part of his life. Um, but I love, you know, he's not just a bogeyman for the sake of it. You know, he, he, there is a, a sense that you, when you get to the end and you, you see there's a tenderness there um, between him and Christine, which there probably shouldn't be. And they wouldn't be if you don't have that chance to try and explore why he was um he is the way he is and i think it was the sense of getting across there's a, a certain manic energy to both those characters on the you know because it, everything is heightened to to, to a, you know everything's turned up to 11 when they're together um and that's what he's doing he is driving her insane so she reaches his level of insanity i think that's that's what i've always read from it and there was one particular bit which when we were talking about the pacing it was the end of phantom it was the end of the you know the song where he's screaming sing for me and if you see that on stage she hits this most incredible note which is painful and it, it's painful to the audience it must be painful for her to sing and it's the it sums up that mania at the middle of you know of their relationship and we were you know it's one of those moments got how the hell am i going to do that because you can't hear it um and as soon as i realized who i'd be working with the art and i don't know how well this will come across in the camera but you get this spread um where yeah, you've got the phantom right in the on. labyrinth with her and then you just zoom in to her mouth yeah, and it right just on. it looks you can hear the note and you, you know yeah. it's like she's singing and she's screaming um and he jose nailed it completely and that sense that everything she does the phantom's there just urging her on um and it was moments like that that yeah we absolutely went let's dive into the horror of this because this is not a normal situation for anyone to find themselves in so their relationship and making making the phantom sympathetic and also appalling um was really important um mm. Yeah, that that was for me. That that was what we needed to 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 hit if we were going to make this a success. Yeah, what a what a perceptive way to put it, mate. How about yourself, big guy? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. My favourite characters are Fermi and Andre. I, I love mm. those two. I think I think they're so funny. Uh, uh, they bring they bring um, uh, when they turn up. I just liked it. There's that lovely bit in, in the corridor after after the first Phantom Attack where they're getting ready for the Mars Ball, and you see this shadowy figure. And he calls out Furmin, and it's just, it's just, uh, I, I love it. I just, there's something about those two characters I like. Uh, actually, for me, the character I don't like is I don't like Raoul. He's, he's, if, uh, if I was Christine, I, I would have chosen the fans. He's a hard character to write. He's a hard yeah, character to adapt. He's wishy washy. He's wishy washy. Well, he's not... But that, that character in El most musicals is often the toughest character to portray. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, I can think of other musicals that have the same issue with that particular character. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 he, the character is an archetype, right? And so the role they fulfill, it, it's difficult. You, the Phantom, like you just said, you can really get your teeth into. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think the depth of, of everything that's going on with the Phantom, it, he's like the purest distillation of that of that super villain archetype. I think your uh, I think your Doctor Doom analogy yeah, for the good. comic books comic book fans out there is a really good one actually, because there's a lot more there than I just woke up one day and decided to wear a mask and be bad. Yeah, yeah. And, and also absolutely. with Rao, there is the there is a sense that you know he's not he doesn't treat her very well in this. No, you know, she, he no, he right. becomes very phantom like in his obsession with destroying the phantom and he yeah. uses her as bait and and especially in the performance that David and I, I saw, the, the, the actor who played Christine, the sense of fear when she realizes that she's singing with the phantom on the stage at the end, spoilers, um, and the, the phantom's <laughs> under the mask, um, under the hood. Um, was palpable and she was amazing and i wish i could remember her name off the top of my head but she was an incredible christine and that sense that christine is completely trapped with all these people who are controlling her life and yeah. that's the that's the horror of phantom the opera that you've got someone who's a pure talent and is being manipulated by everyone else in the play um mm. and you know that's what something we really tried to get in there and and to give christine a little bit of agency at the end as well because she can't she is thrown from pillar to post for the entire thing with mm -hmm. everyone saying this is what christine is and so we tried to give her sense and again i think it's there um but in in our adaptation we really tried to push it to the fore that at the end she makes the choice and she's the one who saves Raoul. she's the one who who gets the phantom to change his mind um you know when he's about to kill everyone 
so she's really important in in and she we don't want to just be the screaming you know um vi um victim throughout the entire thing absolutely uh, uh, yeah I think very right. very well said yeah, yeah. I, I think i think the thing I'm, I'm flicking through my copy of the book as well uh the, the thing that that uh, if you forget is just how violent it is I mean, like the amount of people who get killed in this, you know, and it's not pretty. That there's at least two hangings. Uh, it's it's uh, and that's what I think is interesting. Is it? It starts off almost. It starts off almost like not not a comedy, but it starts off very light hearted, and then mm. it, it it changes and it becomes this this quite sinister story, you know. And 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 I think that's that's what makes it um, so exhilarating. Is that is that it's 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 a it's a, it's a it has a quality to it, you know. Well, it's it's a, it's a dark and macabre tale yeah. of manipulation and obsession. Yeah. And the thing is, you start out because you're on this thrill ride, this kinetic thrill ride. But mm. actually, at the same time, you're getting those thrills and you're seeing the the masterful artifice of it all. It gets darker and darker and darker yes. and darker. It's, and it's, what it's, you touched on, Cav, was exactly that. It's really quite yeah. unnerving and unpleasant to think about. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because over pandemic. Um, we were well, obviously we couldn't go out we used to, we had movie nights in the house we put the big screen up and the projector and one of the things my daughter my oldest daughter is wanting to be on the stage and so we we had a period of watching some musicals you know and um, where they were showing on you know they were showing on youtube and i dug out the old um um royal Albert hall version and put that on for them and and chloe my oldest daughter is the you know, musical lover she absolutely was wrapped up in the music and swept away over there my youngest daughter was absolutely terrified by the phantom and it and it made me and and she's actually she is you know my the mini me in waiting she's the one who's going to love horror films and be watching zombie movies with me when I, when she's older but she completely it wasn't the murders or the, or the death it was the phantom himself she was unnerved by him and it wasn't just a, a scare she was like properly hands in front of the eyes when he was on and that was when his mask was on, you know, before mm. we saw the gore underneath. Um, and of course, I was on a big screen. I don't know what I've done to her. Um, but, you know, and, and to the point now that when she hears the music, she properly doesn't like it because yeah. she she has that sense of the Phantom is not a good person. Um, and, and that sense of dread. And again, that, that sense of dread is vital to the musical and it's vital to the graphic novel as well. Mm. You have to go from the... You know, with the the soprano, with all her, you know, bluster and uh, and pomp, um, to the the you say the theatre managers who are desperate to make a quick buck or frank, um, to this horrible sense of of control uh, um, that's going in that envelops everyone because by the, at the beginning it's just Christine he's he's controlling. By the end he has everyone. Yeah. You know, and so, and that's it was so interesting. And you know, so, I sounds awful. So interesting, my daughter terrified and traumatized. <laughs> but it was interesting to see the story connect in that way. She still yeah. enjoyed it, but she would, yeah. The Phantom was just a no no to her. It was really good because actually, at the end of that performance, they all come back on and they bring on Michael Crawford and they bring back all the Phantoms from the past. And it was good to her to that thing where you you take fantasy back out of it and you go, these are people playing roles. Yeah. Um, and she needed that because she was so invested in the story. Um, and I think sometimes we forget with horror, you get invested in and that investment is fear. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 the drug. And, and that sense of abiding fear, you don't want to be walking mm. through your daily life with that still there. You need to be able to deprogram it. Mm. I think what's so interesting about what you've said and something that should there be anybody who's watching this panel about Titan Comics, Phantom of the Opera graphic novel, who hasn't seen the production hasn't seen mm. it on broadway hasn't seen it on the west end one of the touring productions one of the i think one of the primary reasons to go and see this that we haven't touched upon is that i i think a fascinating thing about phantom of the opera is you feel the music when you're mm. there because mm. there's these really really unnerving when you have the oral motif of the phantom of the opera theme these these really unnerving organ notes that are played on such a bass level they vibrate through the yeah. theater <laughs> and mm. and i think one of the great triumphs of what you've done with the graphic novel is when i was reading it for the first time that's that's the sense memory that i had it wasn't just the music it's I think the that's gut. the reason it's so unnerving. You feel it inside your sternum. You feel that vibration. His voice too, because they amplify yeah. his voice to such a level. Um, I remember one of the times I saw it, the, the Phantom had a really powerful low voice. And there's a moment in the production where 
they're all deciding they're going to bring down the phantom and he booms across the theater so it is war between us and yeah you could say your stomach goes it clenches because you felt that vibration you know what that mean that means and again it's that it's the physicality of seeing a live performance that we were trying in a way to to replicate on on the on on the page we can't obviously replicate that completely so instead of going big we went smaller moments and we pulled you in and that and that was one of the reasons that we we could get more claustrophobic i think because you're so blown away on the stage because it is all around you so with this we were trying to pull you back in and sort of say there's no escape this way you're you're being dragged into these characters mm. I think, I think that's very well said. Guys, before we close out, uh, after this glorious examination of your mm. work with Phantom of the Opera and with the really useful group on this indelible graphic novel version of Phantom of the Opera, what are you working on at the moment? Cav, I know you're a very busy guy. Uh, what, it, what should people be looking out for who uh, enjoy your work on, on, this, on this graphic novel? Well, I suppose the big thing is um, Star Wars The High Republic, which is this big storytelling initiative I, I was uh, one of the um, story art architects for. Uh, I've just written one of the novels, which hit the New York Times list, which was amazing. Um, and I write the Marvel comic that's tied into it. Um, and yeah, if you like my comic work, I'm currently working with DC um, with the Titans, the Teen Titans on a series called Titans United. Yeah. And I have my own, if you're a horror, fan of horror comics, I have my own title from Vault, which is called Shadow Service, which is um, street detectives and witches and demons and spies. It's basically James Bond meets um, Hell. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's, that's out and of the that, And that well. is a, brother, that is a great book. It's oh, a great thank book. You. Yeah. Thank you. Big guy, what about yourself? David Manley Leach, what are you working on? I'm working, I'm looking up on my screen here. I'm currently working on the next issue of Blade Runner 2029, issue 10. Uh, and you're, 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 the, you're the overall um, series editor for all of Titan's Blade Runner books, which are amazing, by the way. Um, thank you. Very, very high quality work. Yeah, thank you. I, I do I do two, uh, Blade Runner Origins and Blade Runner 2029. Um, yeah. Very proud of those two. I'm working on next year and we're doing some new Blade Runner stuff, uh, so which is also very exciting. Uh, that's taking up most of my time. I'm also working on, um, I don't know if I can talk about the other stuff. Yeah, you shouldn't, but I'll <laughs> no, tell you what to. we can <laughs> talk about because you're always too modest to bring it up. If there is one independently published comic that I would urge anybody <laughs> to rush out and buy and read, it is my favorite independent comic. David Leach conquers the universe. Yeah, if you've never read it, you have to pick it up. It is, it, if you, I, I, whether you know David Manley Leach or you don't know him, this will be a hugely resonant and enjoyable thrill ride. So check it out. David Leach Conquers the Universe. If you look it up online, you'll find it. And if you want to see more of these conversations about uh, how we how we bake the cookies at, at Titan Comics, um, come and check us out at Forbidden Planet TV on YouTube. Forbidden Planet is our UK retail chain, famous to anybody who's visited the store in London. Forbidden Planet TV on YouTube. You'll be seeing some more Phantom of the Opera conversations there. And you'll get to hear about behind the scenes, not just Titan Comics, but the glorious world of comics, whether that's DC, Marvel, Image, Boom, all our friends out there in the industry. But in the meantime, this has been the Titan Comics Phantom of the Opera panel. And... Cav, uh, mm. let's close out on if there's one thing you, you you could take away, and it's very difficult to distill 40 minutes of conversation into one thing that's been the greatest pleasure of doing this for you. What has it been, mate? It is that thing of, as I said right at the beginning, it's hopefully creating something that will widen your um but, you know, widen your prospects and your interests, you know, just like people going to the theatre the first time they see a play or a musical and it blows their mind. Hopefully with this, we'll have people who love the musicals, you know, just come out of watching it and they want to take Phantom home with them. This is another way to experience the story. And I hope it, it's also, as I say, a gateway down to the, um, the twisted labyrinth of comics, um, you know, and, and the music of the night that they bring. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my hope for this. <laughs> Very well said, big guy. Uh, for, uh, it's it's a funny thing that the the the, what, the one thing I it's not the one thing. There's something that that we did with Phantom which I love, which is that after uh, before the strip starts, you have what's called prelims, where it's all the credits, it's a half title page, a full title page, and all that sort of stuff, and it ends with a hand pulling the curtain back, and then the story starts. I, I love that bit because for me, it, it, it it's that it's that stepping across from from one thing to another. It's stepping across from 
uh, from the real world into the world of the Phantom. And I just there's something about it. I'm looking at it right now. I'm going to show mm. you because I, I just find it. I find it immensely satisfying. Yeah. I find the idea that, that you know, there's a hand pulling it, and then the story starts. That's what I love. <laughs> uh, people know people get because I tweeted that the other day. Just that page with just the corner and they could see Paris 1905 and people got it immediately. I think wow, I might have hashtagged music of the night, you know, yeah. To, yeah. to help, but people like who know me for star Wars and know, you know, and know me for my love of horror, um, was something like there's a phantom comic and you know, you could see they just click immediately. Right. Um, and Brilliant. there's just something about that hand that it could be anyone, but you sort of get a sense yes. of the yes. smoke behind, you know who it is. Yeah. And the fact he's welcoming you in is actually yes. quite creepy. And I'm getting sort of goosebumps yeah. thinking about it because <laughs> you know what you're walking into, just like Christine knows what she's getting into, but still isn't prepared for it. Um, that's what Phantom of the, Mus Phantom of the Opera does to you. Yeah, brilliant. That, that, that sums it up perfectly. Brilliantly put, gents. Um, and so everyone at New York Comic Con 2021, I hope you've enjoyed pulling back the velvet curtain <laughs> and looking at the dark underbelly of the Titan Theatre and seeing the, the amazing work that Jose, David and Cav have done on the Phantom of the Opera graphic novel. And I urge you, whether you are a Phantom fan, a theatre fan, a comics fan, to A, buy a copy of this graphic novel, you will not be disappointed. And B, get out to the theatre, see Phantom, support live theatre, because it needs all our support and, it, and it's going to get it. And it's been a, it's a glorious thrill ride, the whole comic and the whole Phantom experience. And uh, I hope very much that you enjoy it. And in the meantime, we will see you in the funny papers and in the theatre. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.